Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning to go to Luke's Gospel, chapter number 19. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 19. We'll be looking here this morning at the first 10 verses. If you're joining by live stream this morning, we're glad that you're here. I know some of our folks that are having to quarantine uh, are watching this morning, and as well as those that just typically watch that way since the pandemic especially. And so we're glad that you're here as well. Hope the service will be a blessing to you and challenging to all of us. Luke chapter 19. And a somewhat familiar story, especially those of you that have been in Sunday school as a child and on, you sang songs about Zacchaeus whenever you were young. And uh, some of you probably still sing songs about Zacchaeus now secretly. Uh, and so I, I was reading this this week and I caught myself a couple of times singing Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Uh, and so I was getting ready. And so uh, this morning in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man of false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. And so this morning we're going to continue our theme of reaching out and reaching out to the lost with a personal redeemer. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for again the time that we have. Lord, I pray that you'd bless your word. Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to hearts. If there's anyone here this morning that's never trusted you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, may your convicting power be strong upon their life. May you give them faith to accept Jesus as their Savior. May you give them the courage to step out and to, uh, to receive the help and the instruction that they need uh, to follow how you've told us to come to you biblically. Lord, I pray that you'd help those of us that know you as Savior, perhaps that are struggling in our Christian walk. Uh, Lord, to be reclaimed, uh, to be reinvigorated. Lord, to have our hearts stirred. Uh, to be revived, and Lord, to, uh, to be renewed in our service and our love and our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would help those things to come to fruition in our lives. Uh, again, we thank you for your word and for its availability to us. May we not waste the opportunity that we have. May our hearts be open and attentive. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> As we look here <clears throat> at this passage, Jesus is now... Uh, he's entering. He is on the lookout. It is amazing uh, at what you see when you look. Uh, there are a lot of times whenever, uh, whenever I'm traveling long distances, I like every so often, I kind of need to take just a long drive. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily, it generally is to somewhere, but it, it wouldn't have to be to anywhere. Uh, and I can get lost for hours just looking out the countryside out the window. I'm, I'm looking. I don't want to miss anything when I go by. Sometimes though, whenever we get in the routine of life and the normal, uh, the normal rhythms of life, it's easy to just get, uh, to get kind of focused in on what I have to accomplish or what I get done. And we kind of get tunnel vision and we miss the obvious things that are right around us. We, uh, we find ourselves <clears throat> just kind of going through uh, the motions of life and the routine of life and not really living our life or seeing and then seizing the opportunities that God uh, might place before us. Jesus is going here for a purpose and he is going eyes wide open to minister the gospel, to share with others why he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now he's coming specifically to this place apparently here for Zacchaeus. We'll see later on that he goes to other places for some specific individuals. But in going to reach an individual, he doesn't leave anyone by the, by the side. 
If there's anyone there that's looking, anyone that's searching, anyone that's heart is open, and they're drawn to him, he's always got time for them. He's always meeting the need. He's always saving that soul. He's always uh, doing what, it, what only he can do. Uh, and so we want to be that kind of Christian, that kind of Christian that is looking for opportunities to reach out <coughs> as God puts them before us. Now, I will say a couple of things about reaching out this morning. And that if you're a person who's in need, it's generally difficult to reach out. It's hard to reach out for help. Most people are wired in such a way uh, that whether it be our, you know, put, label it how you want. Dignity, self-respect, pride, uh, any variation of that. It makes it hard for us when we're in times of need to reach out for the help that we need, especially uh, spiritual help, personal help. Why? Because we have to open our heart to get to, to and make ourselves vulnerable for that. I would say this morning that for most of us, it's hard to come to the realization that we're insufficient. If you stop and you think about it, for me to come to a place where I say, I need help, what I'm really saying is, I'm, I'm insufficient to meet this need. I'm not capable of meeting this need. I'm not capable of overcoming this emotional distress or this anxiety or whatever other issue it is. Everything from, uh, from uh, the life-sustaining things like food and housing and those types of things uh, to the very spiritual, the very personal uh, inward things that we deal with in our hearts and lives. It's hard to come to the realization that I'm not enough to handle this problem. Uh, we, don't, we don't like that. That's hard for us to face. It's hard to come to a place where I'm ready to just admit that. It's hard to trust someone enough with that part of our lives to allow ourselves to be vulnerable so that we can actually be helped. If we're not willing to trust someone enough to make ourselves vulnerable and open, they can't help us. Why? Because they really don't know what the root of the problem is. I'm always handicapped whenever I counsel with someone, as any counselor is, as to the information that they give me. If you don't give me the whole story, I can't counsel you to the whole story. So you're getting corrupt counsel sometimes because you're not giving whoever's trying to help you all of the facts to work with. So they're only working with part of the story and then they're trying to give you some guidance for life. That generally doesn't have a good outcome. Uh, it doesn't work well, but I understand it's very difficult to come to a point in a relationship where you decide that you can trust someone enough to be vulnerable enough to share the things that trouble you, that drive you to bad places in your life, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, it, it, it's hard to come to that place. It's a, it's a, I'm, God, I'm insufficient. And I'm open. I'm willing to be and to speak truthfully about the things that I have to deal with. And what it indicates is a level of desperation. Most of the time when we get to that point in our life, we need a level of desperation to, to be the catalyst to drive us to decide whether I really trust you or not. I have to trust you or I can't get, I have no hope of help in this area of my life. Uh, and so it is, uh, uh, it, it's hard to come to that level of trust. I would say also, that it's hard for us to humble ourselves enough to openly express our needs. It's just difficult. There's something about having something internal and then it's a whole nother thing when you begin to articulate it and it's out there verbally, when it's out there vocally. Even if it's in the privacy of an office or, or the privacy of a, of a phone conversation, uh, it's just hard to humble ourselves enough to get to the point where we can just openly express our needs. It's hard to accept hard truth. You know, a lot of times that's where things will break down in counseling, especially in a church level. Uh, when you, you finally get to a place where someone's willing to say, okay, I'm just going to be open and honest and vulnerable, and here it is. Well, now we've got to deal with this hard truth biblically. There may not be a good solution as far as what a person's looking for. Uh, it may require some drastic life changes to come into compliance with the word of God so that God, we put ourselves in a position where God can bless us or God can help us. Uh, but truth is often difficult. We, we live in a culture today that, that interprets truth as 
telling me what I want to hear so I feel good about myself. Okay? That's not truth. All right, if I, if I have cancer and I go to the doctor, I want the doctor to tell me that I have cancer and what can be done about it. And if nothing can be done about it, I want to know that too so that I can make decisions about how I want to finish my life. I don't want them to tell me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you half the truth and, and tell you that you've got a chance when you don't so that I have some false hope. False hope isn't doing me any good. But it's hard for us to be willing to accept truth because we've been conditioned to think that if you love me, you're going to just tell me that what I want's okay. Uh, and that's not God's truth. Truth is the truth. The facts are the facts. What things are in the world in which we live is the world in which we live. And if I'm not willing or able to come to a place where I can stand up and face the honest truth and the facts of a situation, then I can't get past it. I can't grow past it. I can't work through it. I can't, uh, I can't make decisions that are going to help me build a relationship with Christ in the midst of that. But it's hard to accept truth when the truth goes against what I'm doing or how I think or what I feel. It makes it difficult. It's hard to believe sometimes that there's a real solution. You ever get to the place where you feel like I was actually, I was reading a book this week and, and it, had, it had five elements that it was dealing with and I'm reading through the book and I'm thinking, number one, okay, I can get a handle on that. Number two, I can get a handle on that. Uh, or number five, I can get a handle on that. Two, three, and four, I have no real hope of ever being able to reconcile any of those things. Uh, and I'm just thinking, what good is this book for me? It's like, there's the, uh, yeah, you can tell me the solution, but if the other part of the equation of these three things isn't willing to uh, come to the table and to reconcile these differences, then what, where can we go from here? There, there's there's got to be a willingness and there has to be a, an ability to believe that there's a real solution, that, 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 things can, that things can be corrected or things can be, if I go to that doctor and, and they say, yeah, you've got this cancer and this is what we can do about it. And if we do this and you've got a 90% chance of, uh, of being cured or, uh, or, or of having a long-term survival, uh, that I've got to believe that person and trust that person before I have confidence that, hey, yeah, this is a viable solution for me. And in every element of life, whether it be relationships, whether it be my relationship with the Lord, whether it be with a spouse or with children or grandchildren or work relationships or, uh, or just across the board, if I don't believe that there's a real solution, then what's the point? I mean, honestly, if I come in here this morning and I think uh, from a standpoint of my, of my walk with God, and listen, these are, th this is the process emotionally and mentally that we have to go through to come to the Lord in salvation and to come to the Lord to be restored if we are backslidden and fallen away from him. We'll say, Pastor, the Bible just says I have to admit I'm a sinner. And I, I get that. I'm just telling you that if I don't go through this process, I won't get to that point where I'm going to trust him. Because what I'm saying is, is that before I can trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, I have to realize that I'm insufficient. Before I can trust Jesus as my Savior, I have to trust Him enough to be vulnerable about admitting my condition and my need for Him. Until I come to the place where I humble myself and openly express, Lord, I am a sinner and there's nothing that I can do to save my own soul, to reconcile my sin. I'm completely and utterly dependent upon you and then I can't get anywhere. Until I come to the place where I'm willing to accept the truth that if I die without trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior, that I'm going to spend an eternity in a lake of fire, suffering and torment, pain for my sin for all of eternity, until I realize that truth, acknowledge that truth, I'll never trust Him. And until I believe that His virgin birth and His bodily incarnation and His walking amongst us and His sacrifice on the cross, His crucifixion and His resurrection from the grave, until I believe that, there's no solution to my problem. You understand what I'm saying this morning? I'm not trying to make salvation complicated. I'm trying to walk us through the mental, emotional process that we have to go through to have a real, meaningful relationship with Christ so that our lives can be what God would have them to be. Reaching out for help is hard. 
Reaching out and saying, God, I am hopelessly lost. Save me is hard. It is a difficult process. I would say also that reaching out to help is costly. Listen, Zacchaeus had to come to the place where he's a wealthy man. He is an influential man. The Bible makes that clear. He's also a man that's small in stature. And so he wants desperately to see Jesus. So Jesus is coming. He apparently has no clue that Jesus is coming to his house. But why else would he climb the tree? I'd just be waiting at the front door and whenever the crowd comes and clears and I'll, I'll know he's there. And so the, whenever he, when Jesus addresses him, notice the response of the crowd. He's going to eat with a sinner. Well, no kidding. The sinners are the ones that need him. I was a sinner. I am a sinner. I still need him. I needed him to save my soul. I need him to forgive my sin every day. I need him to cleanse my life. I need him uh, to, uh, to be a part of my life. <coughs> what I'm saying this morning is, is that reaching out to help someone is costly. It's hard to receive. It's hard to give because it costs. Listen, three, just three thoughts about reaching out to help being costly. I must have a solution to the problem. If I don't have a solution to the problem, I can't help. Jesus come, came and he provides a real solution. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and said, Pastor, yeah, and you said, because I've not trusted him, I'm going to die. And I'm going to spend eternally in the lake of fire. That's true, but it doesn't have to be true. Because he is the solution. He doesn't come and just say, here's the truth, and then you're condemned. He says, you're condemned, but I come to give you a solution. I come to offer you forgiveness, and I come not just frivolously offering and throwing out forgiveness. i am come having served your sentence, having paid the price, having satisfied the judicial system of heaven. Then you are, you are not only able to, uh, to accept my gift, but you are able to live as if you never committed a crime in the first place. Jesus comes and realizing that he has the solution to the problem. Listen, if I've got no solution, I can't help you. Stop on the side of the road to help somebody broken down on your way. If you don't have what they need, you can't be of any help. And so you've got to have what's the tools that are necessary to really help. Listen, Jesus is not lacking anything. He can help with everything. But it's costly to solve a problem because you have to have the solution. And then secondly, I would say this, you have to care enough to act. I'm glad Jesus cared enough to act. I'm glad that he was moved with compassion. I'm glad that he looked out and said, there goes someone that is destitute and I have the power to solve their problem if only they would look this way and walk over here. No, he went where they were. He went to them. I'm glad Jesus came to me. I'm glad when I've strayed that he's come and sought me out. I, I'm glad uh, to see in, in multiple ways God working in the hearts and the lives of people uh, and doing what's necessary to draw them to himself in various ways, whether it's personal relationship or whether it's what's, what we would call chance encounters. There are real, no real chance encounters. There are divine appointments. Uh, and so God working in hearts and God working in lives. But listen, it, it doesn't matter if I have the solution if I don't care enough to act. Do we care enough to act this morning? Do we care enough to make a difference? I would say thirdly about this, that I must be willing to sacrifice to see it through. So oftentimes we see someone that has a need. We realize, hey, I have the power to meet this need, but it's going to cost me something. And I'm willing to reach out, but I don't want to see it through. Oh, that's more than I bargained for. Uh, pastor, uh, I, you know, somebody came and I gave them the gospel and they trusted him and now they need, to, they, need to, uh, they need to be discipled and they need to learn and they need to grow. Do you have somebody that can disciple them? That's your job. You reach them, disciple them. But that's a lifetime, a lifelong relationship. Exactly. That's the Christian life. 
That's what we've been trying to get through <coughs> to us for the last couple of years, that, that a true discipleship uh, relationship is a lifelong relationship. You don't just say, I won you to Christ, I'm going to go through a 13-week Bible study with you, uh, and uh, don't bother me again after that. No, it's a lifelong relationship, that bond that we have in Christ Jesus so that you can pray together and you can love one another together and you can serve together and you can be investing. And that doesn't mean you're going to study the Bible an hour a week together for the rest of your life, but it does mean that you have a relationship that's established where there is a rapport, where there's a trust, where you can come together and pray, where you can come together and get counsel, where you can come together and get advice. Listen, if you're here this morning and you trust Christ as your Savior, be disciple, be saying, I'm glad I found Jesus, but I want to know more about the Christian life and I want to grow by the grace of God. And once you're established and you're growing, then find someone else and tell them about Jesus and you start teaching them while you're being taught and the sin that perpetuates itself. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what he's established and put his church in charge of. That's what it means when it says that we've been in, put in trust with the gospel. It doesn't do anybody any good if it's bottled up in here. It has to get out there. Jesus didn't say, come to the temple and I'll minister to you. Did he minister to people in the temple? Of course he did. But he also went where they were. And Jesus looked and said, listen, Zacchaeus, I know that it's hard for you. I know that you've been trying to solve this problem yourself. And Zacchaeus expresses that. He said, half of everything that I have, I give to the poor. If, I, if somebody accuses me of defraud, I restore it fourfold. What is he saying? He's saying, Jesus, I am, I, I've got problems and I've done everything that I know how to do to reconcile my problem. And Jesus said, that's good. I come here to share the truth with you. You can't reconcile your problem, but I can. Amen. You can't do enough, but I've already done it. Amen. In this case, he was going to do it, but you understand what I'm saying this morning. When we come to him and we look at what Jesus has done. And I'm just saying this morning that these principles are true when I reach out to God for personal revival. And they were true when I reached out to him for salvation. I had to humble myself. I had to recognize my need. I had to make myself vulnerable. I had to make, be honest. I had to be willing to accept the hard truth. And I had to be willing to look to one who had the ability to solve my problem. His name is Jesus, the Son of God. And he has paid the price. He has sufficient to meet every need and he loves you enough to not leave you wallowing but to seek you out and to find you so that he can help ch change your life. And Pastor why is it so hard for my life to be changed because it's hard to stay vulnerable and it's hard to stay humble and it's hard to stay seeing that I need him and it's hard to, to stay mindful of the fact that I can't do this on my own I've got to have him as part of the process. In every case Jesus has salvation he has the compassion. He has the solution. He has the compassion. And he has the commitment to see it through. It's hard sometimes uh, to, to, to be, because it's hard to stay committed to see things through. Not for him. He's committed to see it through. He'll see it through for eternity. <clears throat> and listen, these principles reveal themselves as we reach out to one another. And ultimately to the lost around us. Now, I'm going to just take a little bit of time, we're going to look at this, this story a little bit here and realize that when we reach out and we must reach out like Jesus reached out, he reached out to meet the spiritual needs of those that, that came across his path. Are we looking for opportunities to share our influence? Are we looking for opportunities to share the gospel with those that come into our spheres of influence? He paid the price for everyone. He sacrificed for everyone. But his demonstration of love, sacrifice, and redemption and in interaction with every believer is personal. So listen, Pastor, Jesus died for everybody. Yes, he did, but he saves you personally. He, he, he made it so that he has the power to solve every person's problem, but he deals with you individually. I can't, I can't trust Jesus for my wife. I can't have day-to-day -day faith in Christ for my wife. I can't make decisions about her life for her. I, I, he deals with her personally. He deals with you personally. Listen, I'm here this morning proclaiming truth, but God is dealing with you personally, individually. Do we come together and worship corporately? Yes, but it's the individual connection that we have with Christ that makes a difference. He is a personal Savior. He is a personal God. Did he die for the masses? Yes, but he deals with the individual. 
He loves you this morning. Does he love everyone? Of course he does. But does he deal with everyone equally? He deals with everyone according to their need. He meets them where they are. And he touches their life and he grows them. I want you to consider three thoughts this morning. Number one, Jesus reaches out personally. Notice what he says in the text. He came. For the Son of Man is come. He came. Listen, <clears throat> how personal is the relationship with Jesus? Two primary thoughts about this. Number one, Jesus came where the need was. It doesn't do any good to show up to meet a need where no need exists. You know, if we decided that we were going to have a, a, a big soup kitchen kind of an event for a day to feed homeless people in Houston, and we had it here in our parking lot, it wouldn't really do much good. All we would have is tired people who were discouraged and disappointed that no one showed up when they had no way to get here. And we didn't meet anybody's need. If we want to meet the need, we need to prepare it, load it up, take it down to the bridge across from Minute Maid downtown, where the big encampment is. What I'm saying this morning is, is that Jesus doesn't say, I came, figure out how to find me. He came where the need was. Notice, and it didn't just start with, hey, he's on earth anyway, so, you know, he's going to, he's going to, like, trawl up around uh, Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee until, and see how many people he can run into. No, he very intentionally and purposely got up off of his throne in heaven and said, I'm going to put on human flesh and I'm going to go to earth and I'm going to walk among, because that's where the need was. The need wasn't in heaven. The need for our salvation wasn't there. We're not there. We're here. <laughs> in John chapter 1 and 14 it said, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what I'm saying is, is that Jesus came where the need was. Do you want to be a blessing to someone? Go where the need is. So, Pastor, I'm, I'm looking around this morning and I had some conversations with someone and, uh, and, and they expressed some needs and they expressed some, uh, some, some desire to grow spiritually. And, uh, and, and can, you, can you help them? Listen, it's not wrong for you to come and ask me to try to help, but why aren't you just seeing the need and stepping up and helping? I mean, if, if somebody came, uh, if Uriah came this morning and said uh, to, to Brother Don after the service and the Sunday school teacher and said, hey, I really want to be disciple, Brother Don. And Brother Don comes to the pastor and says, Pastor, uh, Uriah really wants to be disciple. Do you have somebody that can disciple him? I'm scratching my head and I'm, I'm thinking, can I help Brother Don find somebody to disciple him? But the first thing I'm thinking is, why are you asking me this? Why aren't you working it into your schedule to disciple someone that's in your class? That's what you're supposed to be doing. Why? Because that's a need and God put them in your path and you should be looking to the path. Now, I'm grateful that Don has that attitude this morning. But we all ought to have that attitude this morning. When we look at those that God sends our way, whether it's their first Sunday or whether it's their fifth Sunday, and we're looking for opportunities to say, as they express a desire to grow and to know more and to learn, instead of saying, boy, it sure would be great if somebody would step up and help them. Maybe that's the Lord speaking to your heart, telling you that you ought to be the one to step up and do the helping. If you're going to wait for the people that are willing and that are active doing it now uh, to have time, they're that person that has the need is going to lose interest before their time's freed enough to help them because they're already busy helping people. God put us together collectively as a church body to be the body of Christ, to be loving one another, to be sharing our faith, to be growing together in the grace of God and to be making a difference and impacting life. What did Jesus do? He went where the need was. Wherever there was a need, he was on his way. He came to earth because we needed him. He came to this earth because we were desperately in need of him and our sin. And we were lost. And if there was no one to pay the price of our sin that would be an acceptable sacrifice before God in heaven. If there was no one to do that, we would all be condemned for eternity. Jesus came. He went to the needy. You should have noticed that he goes to the religious. You know, sometimes <coughs> we look and uh, society looks and thinks, oh, the religious crowd's got it figured out. No, the religious crowd is on the express train to the lake of fire. Yeah. And they just think that they've got front row seats to the good spot. But they're really in trouble. Why? Because they're trusting in religion. 
And it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. If I don't have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter how many times I go to church. If I don't have a relationship with Christ, if I've never accepted him as my savior, uh, I could be a charter member. I could be, uh, I could be uh, my name on a plaque out in the lobby. I can have buildings named after me and I'll still spend an eternity in the lake of fire because it's not about that. It's about, am I a child of God? Have I trusted him as my savior? Listen, Jesus went to the needy. He went to the religious in John chapter three. And we don't have time this morning to get into all of these texts in depth. I'm just saying in John chapter three, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, hey, uh, Lord, I came at night because he did, was afraid that he would jeopardize his political standing and his, his religious standing amongst the other Pharisees and Sadducees. And, uh, and he came to Jesus by night and said, hey, what, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must accept what I'm providing. You must face the truth that you are lost without me. You must put your faith and confidence in me. He came to the religious and he said to the religious, you think that you've got religion, but what you need is a relationship with the Savior. I'm just saying this morning that Jesus personally came to those and Jesus personally comes to those who are religious, but the religious are often the most difficult to reach. Why? Because they think that they've got the answer. I have a, a, a book in my office. It's a thousand questions about a particular religion. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an apologetics book. It's a defense of their false religion. And when you read through it, 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 the, the scriptures that they use to make their points are so obviously distorted from what they mean. But there are millions of people across the world that believe it with every fiber of their being. Why? Because Satan's a deceiver. Listen, the religious crowd are hard to reach because they think they've got the answer. Listen, the answer is the word of God. The answer is the God of the word. It's Jesus. That's, all, that, that's it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to the religious. Not only that, he went to the rejected. So, Pastor, I'm here this morning. I'm not religious. I'm the outcast. I'm the rejected. I'm the one that society snubs its nose and looks at. Well, I've got good news for you this morning. Jesus came to you too. In John chapter 4, there's a woman at a well who is known as uh, a woman of ill repute. She's got multiple and had multiple husbands. And she's got all these issues. It's so bad for her that no one, uh, she can't even go and gather and get her water for the day when everybody else goes. She has to go during the heat of the day because no one else wants to be in her presence. And she's shunned and she's an outcast uh, and she's looked down upon. And Jesus wanted to reach out to her so desperately that he said, I must needs go through Samaria. And the Jews hated the Samaritans. The disciples said, why are we going that way? What are we going to go there for? What are we going to do? We can't go there. Everybody will look down on us. And Jesus said, no, I've got to go that way. Why? Because there's a woman there that needs me. There's a woman there that no one else will give the time of day to. There's a woman there that everyone else has rejected and written off. And I'm going to meet her. Well, what are people going to say when they see you talking to her? I don't care. I'm going to go to her in a public setting. I'm going to go to her where, where everything is above board, where no accusations can be leveled. And I'm going to share with her the truth. And he went in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well. And an entire town came to Christ because he did. Listen, it doesn't matter this morning whether you're religious or whether, uh, whether you're halfway hung over. What matters is that Jesus has come to you. And he loves you. And he cares about you. And he comes to the rejected. Not only that, he even goes further than that. He goes to the repulsive. In Matthew chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4, uh, the, the lepers come to him. And as this leper man comes to Jesus, he said, Lord, if you will, you can cleanse me. I mean, he comes with great faith. He comes in, uh, in Matthew 8 and verses 1 through 4 and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me whole. You can cleanse me of this uncurable disease. You can cleanse me. You can take away my death sentence. And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, I see your faith and I will be thou clean. And immediately he was cleansed. And Jesus said, go make the sacrifices that Moses commanded as a testimony to those that are working in the temple today. That the, mir the miraculous can happen. That sin can be cleansed. You understand leprosy is just a picture of our sin. It's an incurable disease. 
It's an incurable thing that dominates our life. And the longer it goes, the more it wears on us and the more it eats away at us and the more corrupt and vile we become, even to those around us that are close, to the point that when they walked into the city, they had to yell, unclean, unclean, so that everybody could, could scatter. Kind of feel like that if you've got COVID today, right? <clears throat> I'm saying this morning that Jesus put on display his love for the repulsive. If there was anybody that was deemed repulsive in that time, it was the leper. They had to live in colonies. They were regulated. There wasn't much they could do, and Jesus didn't care. He came to them anyway. If you didn't notice the repulsive, he ate with publicans and sinners in Luke chapter 5 and verses 30 through 32. And we'll look there just quickly in Luke uh, chapter 5 and verses 30 through uh, 32. Jesus comes and, uh, and says it this way. <clears throat> But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I came to those that are humble enough to see their need. Those that are willing to put their life and to trust me, uh, to be vulnerable to me. He ate with publicans and sinners. He opened the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11. That's more significant than the others that he raised from the dead because John was left there intentionally to make a point for, for the fourth day. The fourth day, the decomposition really set in. Up to three days, it wasn't considered corrupt. But after that third day, it was corruption. That's why Jesus was three days in the tomb. Uh, he, he would not see corruption. He couldn't say the fourth day. He waited till Lazarus was there the fourth day. Why? Because he wanted to make a point that I have come to give life to the corrupt. I have come to restore the corrupt and make them incorruptible. I am come to make alive again those that are dead. And I'm saying this morning that Jesus came and he opens the tomb. And if you're here this morning feeling as if you are without hope and that God can't turn your life around and that your fate is sealed, may I say to you that Jesus comes with the power, with the ability, with the willingness to be able to break the seal of that tomb and to open it and to set you free and to make you whole again. He loves you. Jesus reached out personally. He came himself. He came to the individual. He shared his love. He spoke the truth. He called them to repentance. He didn't come and say, oh, it'll be okay, just keep living in your sin. No, he said, go and sin no more. And he gave him the power to do it. I would say, secondly, that Jesus reached out powerfully. Notice that he said in our text this morning, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. And when Jesus came... <clears throat> In verse 10, he came to seek and save. He had the power to find you. He has the power to save you. Three thoughts about this. Jesus came with power to save, to solve every problem. They say, Pastor, God can't save me. My problems are, my sin's too big. No, he can solve it and save every problem. There is no sin so great that Jesus is unwilling to forgive it. There is no, there is no person that is so uh, corrupted that their life is so fractured that Jesus can't restore it. I'm not saying this morning that all of the after effects of our decisions will go away. We're still going to reap what we've sown. We still have to live with our scars. We still, but there's healing Amen. and there's forgiveness and there's empowerment to see it through. Jesus came with the power to solve every problem. The second thought I would say about this is that Jesus came with the power to search every person's heart. Pastor, I just can't be vulnerable enough. You might as well be with Jesus because he already knows anyway. Amen. You know, we find ourselves having that conversation, that argument with God. I just can't let this go. I just can't open this up. I can't be vulnerable. About this. I can't share this with my spouse or I can't share this with my, uh, with my closest person, the, the people closest to me in my life. I can't even share this with my paid counselor or, or whoever it is. Uh, but uh, but I, and I, so I'm having a hard time sharing it, Pastor, with God and, let, and giving it to him. Listen, you might as well. He knows anyway. Amen. I might not know. My wife might not know. She may not know. I may not know about hers, but he knows. 
He came with a power to know and to search every person's heart. Thirdly, I would say, he came with a power to save every soul. He didn't die for some, he died for all. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not wanting uh, for people to die and go to hell. He wants people to die and come to heaven. He came to pay the way. And realize this morning, every sin that's ever been committed has been paid for by Jesus. Yep. Every person that spends an eternity in the lake of fire does so having a ticket that's laying wasted on the side, unused, because he paid for it. It was purchased by his blood. Jesus reaches out powerfully. He has the power to save you. He has the power to set your life in order. He has the power uh, to resurrect everything in your spiritual life. Thirdly, I would say this, that Jesus reached out passionately. Jesus reached out passionately. Notice that it says, for the Son of Man has come, he came in power to seek and to save that which was lost. He came passionately. I love you. I love you enough to find you. I'm saying that Jesus came committed to redeem. You understand that our, our storyline here this morning in our text, that this is before the cross. Jesus comes forgiving sin, knowing that he has to see this through on Calvary. Knowing that he's going to have to rise from the grave. And it's one thing to know, hey, I've got to give my life in sacrifice. It's another to think I've got to resurrect myself from the grave. I've got to restore life to myself after I'm dead. God gave him that power. God gave his son that ability and Jesus comes to him and he says, Zacchaeus, I see you up there. Come down. I'm coming to your house. Let's sit down and eat. I need to abide with you. I need to spend some time with you. And he comes down and he says, I can't believe that you came to see me and I've got all of these problems. And man, I'm trying to do everything I can. I, I, I give away half my money and I try to do this and I try to do that. And Jesus says, wait a minute, hold on. I came to seek and save that which was lost. You can't do it. You can't meet your need. You you can't save yourself but I can and I can forgive you but when Jesus made those claims when Jesus made those statements throughout his earthly ministry he made those statements with a realization that if he did not offer himself a sacrifice on Calvary's cross as God had ordained that all of those promises would have been null and void unfulfillable the sin would have been reinstated and he also knew that he had to get up out of that grave three days later Conquering death and hell. And with confidence he said, I am committed to see this through. I will give myself for you on that cross. And I will rise up in victory over that grave. And I will reclaim you to myself. And Jesus came committed to redeem. He comes committed to reclaim. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, that's all well and good. I trust that Jesus is my Savior. I know that positionally I am a child of God. I'm going to go to heaven. But I've made such a disaster out of my life. I've made such a disaster out of my walk with him. May I say that he's care he cares about you too. And he's committed to restore your life too. He's committed to revive your spirit too. And Luke chapter 22 uh, and verse number 32, uh, the Bible says this to us there as he comes to Peter, back up to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He's not saying, Peter, you don't know me as Savior. Peter clearly already knew him as Savior. He's saying, Peter, you're going to go through some things and Satan's going to seemingly win the victory in your life and you're going to be torn away from me and you're going to feel destroyed and you're going to reject me you're going to deny me and I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to forgive you for that and I'm going to raise you up and I am when you are converted when you are restored when I have reclaimed you then you're going to go out and you're going to do great things for me just look and see what Peter did in the book of Acts just read through his books and see what he did. The other disciples and the apostles, uh, many of them, some of them struggled at different times, but none struggled so much as Thomas. Thomas struggled so much that we know him as what? Whenever you hear the name the apostle Thomas, the disciple Thomas, the first thing we think is doubting Thomas. Everyone else seemed to believe, but he didn't believe. And Jesus didn't leave him in his doubting. Jesus didn't leave him uh, floundering. Jesus came to him in John uh, chapter 20 
And he said, hey, uh, Thomas, I heard that you said that unless you, unless you could see my nail prints and unless you could thrust your hand into my side, into the sword piercing, uh, or the spear piercing, unless you could see those things uh, that you wouldn't believe, he says, I'm right here, come and, come and put your hands in here. Come and put your hand in here. And Thomas's response in John chapter 20 and verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. I'm just here to tell you this morning that if you know Jesus as your Savior, but you're not living for him and you've turned against him and you've backslidden against him and your life spiritually is a wreck this morning, that he came to seek you and he came to restore you and he cares about you and he loves you and he is committed to reclaiming you and setting you on a path that's productive and that's life changing. I would say this morning that Jesus came committed to reveal. He came committed to reveal. In Romans chapter number 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 1 and verses 16 and 17. He, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. Understand this morning, the righteousness is revealed. God's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is revealed from faith to faith to faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. Live for God. Be reclaimed by God. Let God grow and develop your faith that others might see that faith developing and growing in you and then in them and others might see it in them and others might see it in them. Why? So that Jesus Christ is high and lifted up, drawing people unto him and lives are changed. I'm just telling you this morning that we have a solution to our sin problem. I'm telling you this morning that we have a solution to every problem that we face. Pastor, does that mean uh, that all of my problems magically are going to go away? No, it means that Jesus is going to be right there in the midst of them. And your spiritual, your emotional problems, Jesus can come and he can touch and he can heal. And when he does the hard things in life that come your way, Jesus helps you understand how he's going to use that to help you reach a neighbor, to help you reach a loved one, to help you uh, make a difference, to help your light shine brighter. Sometimes God chooses for his children to suffer. Sometimes it's time to get sick and to die and go to heaven. Sometimes it's just the purpose of, it's a matter of God fulfilling his will and purpose and uh, across the world so that the son of God can come back and receive his bride, the church, up into himself so that he can come and he can reign on David's throne like the Bible says he's going to. Every time you see bad things happen, it doesn't doesn't mean that the world's falling apart. It means that God is at work. Amen. And when I'm spiritually healthy, God helps me to fulfill my role in the midst of all of that, whether it's pleasant or whether it's unpleasant, whether it's what the world sees as good or what the world sees as bad, whether it's easy or whether it's hard, is irrelevant. What's relevant is that Jesus has touched my heart and healed my soul and can use me and let my light shine in the midst of whatever goes on around me. That's the Christian life. That's the life that he wants to give you. That's the life that he came to Zacchaeus' house and offered. Zacchaeus, I see you up there. Hey, little man. Just come on down here. I came to see you. I know the crowd's here and the crowd's pressing and the crowd's in. Oh, I have time for them. But I'm here for you. Sometimes you feel like God's there for everybody but you. That's just the devil. That's just our unwillingness and our inability to understand how valuable we are to him. Pastor, I don't have any value. I'm not worth anything. You are to Jesus. And Zacchaeus came and he's going to climb a tree to try to spot him. And Jesus just said, don't worry about all these others. I got plenty for them, but I'm here for you. When you look out this morning and you consider everyone that's in the room and you look around and you say, man, God's really helping that person down the road for me and God's really helping, but I wish I was important enough for God to help. May I say to you that God's got plenty for him, but he came here for you. Yes. And he brought you here for him. Will you respond to him this morning?
because he's committed to redeem your soul. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he is committed to give you eternal life. If you're here this morning and you know that Jesus is your Savior, but you're not living for him and you're not committed to him and your life is a wreck, mentally and maybe you may look all calm, cool, and collected on the outside, but internally you know that my life is unraveling spiritually inside. May I say to you, he is committed to restoring you. And if you're here this morning and you want to know him at a greater level, if you want a deeper, meaningful relationship with him, may I say that he's here committed to reveal more of himself to you as you open your heart and make yourself vulnerable to him. It doesn't matter what anybody else in this room does. It doesn't matter if every person comes down here and prays or if no one comes or if one comes. What matters is that, uh, what, what matters is that whoever is open, Jesus came to speak to you. It's personal. He's a personal God. He's a personal Savior. And he'll change your life personally. Listen, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's not that God won't use other people to help. But I'm not going to change your life. Your Sunday school teacher can't change your life. Your deacon can't change your life. The person that invited you here today can't change your life. But Jesus can. Yep. Amen. And he didn't send somebody else to do it. He might send someone else to help. But when it comes down to it, he's the great physician. He's the one that does the saving and the transforming and the changing. We have the solution this morning, my friends. His name is Jesus. Yep. Your neighbors that you'll see as you drive home this afternoon, as you drive in and out of your subdivision for work, that ambulance that went down your street the other day, that fight that happened over the privacy fence in your backyard, you may not have the solution to that problem, but Jesus does. Do we live in such a way that others see Jesus in us? We have the solution. Do we have the compassion? And do we have the commitment to share it with others in a way that causes them to want to look to Jesus and accept what he's offering this morning?